Investors Chronicle. Welcome to the Companies and Markets show. It's Thursday, the 25th of January, as we record. Today, we are going for gold. There is nothing like a 30-year-old reference to start a podcast, is there? And discussing the precious metal because, be it due to the bad news of geopolitical instability or the good news of potentially lower interest rates, the last few months have been better ones for bullion, and there's plenty going on at the gold mining companies themselves. So we'll be discussing trading updates from Sentiment and Hochschild, as well as recent events, shall we say, at FTSE 100 constituent Endeavour Mining. Then our cover story this week is on a very different type of material, textiles of all kinds, from fast fashion to technological breakthroughs, we're going to examine how that world is changing and what kind of company is trying to take advantage. And finally, we're talking about a hitherto unfashionable company that's become a success story of the UK market. That's promotional goods manufacturer for Imprint, which put out another well-received trading update the other day. Joining me to discuss all of this are of the line, Julian Hoffman. Uh, thank you, Henry Kelly. Indeed. Thank you, Julian. <laughs> and in the studio, Gemma Slingo. Hi, Dan. Alex Hamer. Hello. And Alex Newman. Hi, Dan. And Alex, I should also mention, uh, given you're here, that next week sees the release of episode five of the Lee and the IC podcast, in which Lord John Lee and Alex discuss another one of John's small cap holdings, as well as his thoughts on the rise of passive investing and lots of other things in between. So if you're interested in that, you can subscribe to the monthly episode via your regular feed or head to our podcast page on the website. For now, though, we are going to stick with gold. Julian, you wrote up the sentiment results uh, last week now, the trading update. Uh, what did you make of it? Yeah, a sentiment, uh, formerly known as sentiment, Egypt, a Middle East focused gold miner uh, has always been in the sort of background of the market. The update was interesting, really, for mainly for the, the fact that uh, it met most of its uh, production targets without too much trouble. Uh, usually what happens in uh, in Egypt is that there's uh, some kind of a disruption to production or uh, cost rise suddenly in certain areas, and uh, that didn't seem to happen this time. So uh, the market reaction has been pretty muted to uh, to sentiment itself. But uh, I noticed that the the share price has started to rise uh, over the past uh, couple of months, and that can't be unrelated to the fact that the dollar is falling and uh, the gold price itself is is moving up uh, anyway. So we've got uh, gold well above. Two thousand dollars an ounce, or at the spot price. So, sentiment is producing gold at a cost of seven fifty to eight hundred dollars an ounce. So, you can see the maths are working out for them. So, it's it was you know a relatively steady as she goes kind of update from them, and uh, uh, their forecasts uh, are looking achievable. They're definitely on course to uh, to produce about half a million ounces, split fifty fifty this year between the two halves and. Uh, yeah, the the cost range is quite right, uh, quite wide, but it's uh, somewhere between seven hundred and eight hundred and fifty dollars an ounce. It seems to be where they're at. A an interesting indicator for investors, mainly because of what it tells us about the direction of uh, the dollar and uh, inflation and the gold price. The higher gold price is definitely going to be a, a tailwind, clearly for for gold miners. Uh, we'll come to the future direction of that in a minute, and maybe whether these miners have been keeping up with uh, the recent rises too. But uh, Alex Hamer, if we just turn to you to talk about the other update from yesterday, as we record, so two days ago as this goes out, Hoxchild, how did that look? Was it similar to Sentiment, similar scenario? How are they faring? They provide two interesting examples of, of gold miners, um, contrasting, I should say, because Hoxchild has really focused in recent years on diversifying basically where it gets its gold and silver from. So so it's it's got one one big mine in Maculata, which has been off and on in recent years. And and, and in the past year, they, they went from waiting on a, a government permit to expand it, which they, they finally got mid last year, um, triggering a bit of a share price rise um, because investors have been waiting on it for quite a while. And they're also building a new mine in Brazil, which actually spreads some of that production risk away from Peru and adds a lot of ounces quite cheaply. So they're really... Um, they're really on the on the move upwards, um, and that contrasts with with sentiment, which has one gold mine 
uh, in Egypt, as, as Julian was saying. And, you know, I think it's been a, an interesting one to watch for investors over the past decade, even, because I think, I think there's a pretty strong retail holding and there is a real um, push uh, from investors for them to, to spread some of that, that production. Um, they've got a development project in, in Cote d'Ivoire. They're also drilling on the outskirts of the, of the current holding in Egypt. And they've also, you know, they've got both uh, open pit and underground production at Sakari, the mine in Egypt. Um, but there is a sense that, you know, as soon as there's a little wobble, you know, as student Julian alluded to in terms of operations there, we had a, a rock fall in the pit, I think last year or the year before, and that knocked off shares off a lot. Um, obviously if you've got a few mines, but spreading that risk, that's, that's not so much of a, of an issue, but yeah, as, as you actually initially asked me, Dan, um, yeah, Hochschild posted pretty strong set of, um, 2023 numbers. They produced about 300,000 ounces of gold. Um, that includes the silver as well, but they kind of even it out to give you a clean number. They are really focused on getting this new mine in, in Brazil built though. It's kind of the, the shiny new option where it's Peruvian operations have all been running a while. They're quite expensive in terms of mines go. Um, Julian was talking about sentiment running under $1,000 in terms of a cash cost. If you include their capital spending, um, which you often do to give a clear example of how much or what the real margin is at that time, um, that gets pushed up to $1,200, $1,300 an ounce. Some of Hochschild's mines, they're running kind of $1,400, $1,500 an ounce. So even when gold's at $2,000, you still, you know, that's that's not the biggest margin. Whereas this new mine, Mara Rosa, is running a well, they'll hope to run a, a an all in cost of of um, I think just under a thousand dollars an ounce. So it, it should be a really profitable mine uh, once they get it up and running, which is in, it'll enter commissioning this quarter. So that that's really exciting for Hoxshield. We I put them on a sell about eighteen months ago, largely related to their permitting issues as well as the you know questions over the portfolio debt levels. But they've basically come out of that period with the permit. This Mara Rosa mine is going to add ounces um, at low cost, as I've said. And also, you know, they've, they've taken other actions to, to, to cut costs in Peru as well. Um, so they're, they're looking like they're in a pretty good position. Well, let's turn to the other company you mentioned up top, Endeavour, who until recently had been, you know, the best performer of recent years, share price-wise. But they have now ejected their chief executive uh, in a rather unusual situation, which has obviously hit the shares and it's related to something from a couple of years ago. Uh, can you say a bit more, a bit more about that as, as carefully as we can? Yeah, I'll walk through the, the, the garden path of, of, of very legal language from, from, from the company, but effectively, um, Sebastian de Montessou, uh, was fired earlier this month, um, in relation to a, a payment he directed in 2021, um, between the buyer of one of their mines and then uh, a creditor that was providing security services um, at the time. And he, yeah, he, he says, I, yep, yeah, I did that. Um, it was, you know, related to, to security at the time and, and that was my focus and I should have gone to the board and got it all ticked off, but I didn't. He's a fairly mercurial type and has kind of led some pretty serious deal-making in West Africa both at Endeavour and in previous, um, you know, in previous jobs. It's not a huge surprise that, that this kind of thing has happened, but it is more of a surprise that the board has reacted so strongly. And this is a board that has paid him, I think they made him the best paid CEO in the FTSE 100 in 2021, even though Endeavour is kind of a, a fraction of the size of some of these operators. So I think they've done things like that, and now they're trying to claw that money back as well um, after sacking him. De Montesu says, I, I did this, but the way you've handled this is is not right. He says he hasn't been given a, a fair chance to explain it to the board, both in terms of the the, the directed payment in 2021, the, the, the clawback of the bonuses, um, which which could have him out kind of, I think it's about $20 million. So it's it's high drama. Where that leaves investors is a company run by Ian Cockerell, who has been in the, the space for a very long time. He was chair of Polymetal. Um, he's, you know, done a lot of jobs in the sector. He's stepping in as, as CEO. Um, he was already on the board and he, I think he's, he's a fairly well-known figure and, and, he, and he is trusted. I mean, we even got a, a, an upgrade on 
on Endeavour by um, Livram Zuen Lowe, who said with Cockerell in charge and the, the depressed share price, it's it's not a bad time to buy the company. Yeah. I should say that uh, de Montessu, there's no suggestion that he benefited personally from this payment. It's just the, the declaration really of that. And, That's and right. clearly that, that uncertainty, as you say, ha- has knocked the shares, I think about 20%, if not more. So uh, speaking of Libram though, and, and, and that upgrade, uh, they have also been discussing the fate of the gold price, which ultimately is going to drive the fortunes of these companies for better, for worse. And they've been discussing it in the context of a potential Trump presidency. Now, I realise in my in my notes before this uh, podcast, I completely mischaracterised what was going on, but uh, I'm going to try and get it right this time. But I do I do think that it's interesting to consider that you know uh, event as as far away as it may be, uh, and you know it may not even happen from the prism of the gold price, because on the one hand you can say more geopolitical instability that may be caused by a Trump presidency it would be good for the gold price. On the other hand, you know Trump likes. Uh, as we saw last time, last time he was uh, in charge, loose fiscal policy, pretty loose monetary policy, uh, which could be good for the for the gold price again. He, like, but he equally, likes gold as well, doesn't he? Well, by his, <laughs> there you go. Trump Towers. But the, the flip side of this is the whole buying gold and geopolitical instability angle to me seems slightly unusual insofar as what normally happens when things go really, uh, you know, arise, the dollar rises and that is bad for gold. So... I don't know. I don't know if anyone here has any thoughts on on the Libram analysis or you know the path of gold this year. Alex, start with you. So it's it's both the Trump election and then what Yuan says in in fairly dramatic language might be the the, the consequences. So so I'll just read you his words. We believe that the Trump re-election will result in elevated global war and trade tensions with associated inflation risk. Um, Is that elevated war tensions or elevated war? Uh, uh, just presumably... elevated war. Right. Um, okay. So. You know, fair bit of downside there for, for the for for the globe itself. But as you pointed to, Dan, um, there is this idea of gold as a safe haven asset. It's an interesting one because I think, well, you know, we might have other things in our mind if if there's a, you know, a bit more war on. But um, these these companies have have traded behind the gold price mostly. I think in 2023 it was only Hochschild out of the 350 that that outperform bullion itself and now it's 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 where you know with gold at over 2000 and potentially staying there and even climbing as as we head into a fairly volatile year um in which there's also declining interest rates and a a weaker dollar um that this operational gearing kicks in and these companies should should see their earnings go up um and i think that's that's really what yuen's pointing to here um but I think, you know, we, we, there's a few pieces in the magazine this week about the potential for rate cuts to not not come through in the in the way that's that's mostly priced into a lot of equities um, and currencies. So there's also that risk where investors are actually a bit happier to stay, um, you know, in these kind of um, lower risk assets because the the the, the risk free rate still so so high. Julian, do you have any thoughts on the the path of gold this year? I know you did write about the uh, the potential for interest rate cuts to not materialise to the extent people think uh, this week in the magazine, as Alex alluded to. I had an interesting conversation with the the, uh, the chief executive IG group on this topic. What they noticed most clearly, I mean, obviously IG group uh, caters to quite sophisticated traders and investors, is that a lot of the reason why gold in particular seems to be doing quite well is that quite a lot of other under other assets, when you look under the hood, are doing at best mediocre, uh, and in some cases are actually in reverse. So the market seems to be pricing in a definite kind of turmoil already uh, for the later part of the year in terms of um, equities, and and that can only be good, I think, for the strength of gold. Where the dollar fits in is, is I, I think at the moment it looks paradoxical, doesn't it? That um, in theory the dollar should be rising, uh, but that hasn't uh, been the case. But um, we'll see later, I think, in the year whether that materialises. But uh, I thought that was an interesting point, really, that, that you know things are not as um, robust as they look, and uh, once you strip out those the super performing shares out of various indices then uh, the, the underlying trend seems to be people uh, putting their cash into 
either cash or, or gold, uh, all gold-related uh, assets. So it's a, it's a definite uh, paradox and an interesting one, really, from a, an investment point of view. Indeed. Well, nonetheless, if you had put your cash in equities last year, admittedly, partly because of those, uh, you know, magnificent seven, you would have done fairly well. But we'll see what the year holds, as ever. Uh, Alex, just to Alex Newman, this is just to wrap up our gold discussion. Uh, I think you maybe had some thoughts on its role in in asset allocation in a portfolio in general. I suppose in terms of the outlook for for the year. I would probably sit on the fence and say, I mean, as ever with volatile assets, it's, it's always very, very hard to call what the, you know, um, full respect to Librem, I'm, I'm sure their analysis is right on the money. Though I would probably make the caveat, though, you, you know, we've had Donald Trump out of the White House for several years and it doesn't feel like geopolitically things are, you know, in a fantastic place. So not ne- wouldn't necessarily buy that, um, you know, that view that, Trump equals more unstable world because it feels like an unstable world. And if gold prices are proxy to that, then, um, uh, yeah, that seems a, a bit of a confusing point. But the um, the other points about the, I suppose, the gold price long term, you know, f- for the miners that we've been talking about and for the mining industry globally, you know, like many other commodities, the, the ore bodies from which gold has, you know, have traditionally been drawn are getting harder and harder to you know to, to provide a sort of valuable resource and it's getting harder for for miners to replace their reserves at the same time you've got lots of sources of gold demand which you know are completely unrelated to anyone's view on the dollar you know jewelry um just as a store of value in 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 china and india and parts of the world where uh, gold has you know has a you know not only a diversifying but a sort of store of store of value um effect but i suppose the 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 question always for investors is what kind of gold do i want to hold so you know for some only physical gold's going to do and then you know for for others it's only the physical backed gold etfs or, or you know which which they're going to they're going to hold on to when it comes to i suppose miners the the point that that Alex made, you know, about how well they've done in outperforming the gold price, I think is like a really, really important one. I mean, it, listeners might remember a guy called Mark Bristow, who used to be the CEO of, well, he was the CEO of Rangold Resources. Now he's the CEO of Barrett Gold, which bought Rangold um, at the end of 2018. And he always used to rail against the equity value destruction in the industry that basically miners aren't very good at beating the gold price, which the whole reason you'd think for holding a, a gold miner is that they're a leveraged play on gold. And, and you know, Barrett Gold is sort of the exemplar of like tier one gold assets in the world, but the returns under Mark Bristow's watch have been, you know, pretty weak, really. It's a total return of 29%, which is half the rise in the dollar spot gold and less than a third of the return from equities. So, you know, at the risk of putting a dampen on everything, I just, you know, the, the risk trade-off with gold miners and the gold mining sector notwithstanding i think you know sentiment looks really really cheap at the moment and if you have a very constructive view on the gold price then i can see totally why that's it's a tempting maybe short-term uh, trade but just the risk is just so fraught for miners from nationalization to just managing costs operational issues that it seems to me that in a portfolio gold gold you know physical gold does a better job of providing that diversification than um, the miners but that's probably just having covered the sector like alex being bitten one too many times from um (laughs) from uh we're getting bullish about gold miners and then yeah what about the four percent dividend yield that uh, that is true yeah sentiment has been a good income for a for for a day a year yeah indeed which um you know gold itself will never be able to achieve so yeah that is definitely one of the uh, plus points well, if you want to know more about the gold sector in general, you can look for our wrap-up and our analysis of the sector in next week's cover feature, which is the special annual FTSE 350 supplement. This week's cover feature, however, is on, as I say, textiles. Gemma, you've written the piece. There's lots of issues uh, percolating here, You know, whether it be the rise of fast fashion, the rise of uh, reusing fashion, reusing clothes and reselling and things like that. But can can we say a little bit about the the overall outline of the, the piece and what you're you're looking at here? Yeah, so listeners will know that we follow the clothes retailers pretty closely and pay lots of attention to the post Christmas trading updates, the quarterly updates, basically what's going on moment to moment. And this makes a lot of sense, I guess, because brands quickly fall in and out of fashion. But it struck me it would be useful to take a broader look both across the supply chain and also 
across a, a longer time horizon to see what sort of things are materialising, no pun intended, sorry, um, sort of what sort of things are happening and the things that could put the current big players at risk. Because um, it feels like the fashion industry for a long time has been in a state of denial and is now on the cusp of some quite major changes. A lot of that is linked to climate change, obviously, and the environmental impact textiles are having. Um, and you've got this big wave of regulation that seems to be on the horizon. But it seems that companies as well are also starting to experience actually the physical impact of climate change when you think about their supply chains in Asia. So basically, I just wanted to have a broad look at the at the sector and see sort of long term what investors should be doing. That that climate change uh, aspect is important, isn't it? Because we, we hear a lot about the environmental footprint of uh, clothing manufacturers and among various other aspects. And there is sometimes a lag effect with these things. But as you say, it does seem like there are developments, changes starting to be made to various parts of the supply chain. Uh, and companies, some of which are, are listed as well, are involved in that. Can you say more about those companies and what they're trying to do and what they're trying to improve? Yeah, so when I set out, I tried to find companies that are basically poised to benefit from supply chain changes. So it might be companies that make new types of material that aren't as reliant on virgin plastic or ones that are doing recycling, anything basically that's addressing this massive problem. Um, and it was surprisingly difficult. It, one of the things that struck me when I was writing the piece was that so many clothes are being made and there's just so few being recycled. But actually, when you sort of start looking, you see there are some interesting small companies, not necessarily in the UK, but a little bit further afield that are worth a look. But also at the the bigger end of the of the spectrum, there are some quite established players that are starting to to change how they operate or introduce these new lines, which are actually quite exciting sources of growth. So yeah, I try and cover a bit of a, a spectrum in the piece. Inevitably, with new technologies, as we've, we've seen across various sectors in the past couple of years, higher interest rates have caused some problems. You know, sometimes these companies are clearly at the early stages of growth, they're pre-profitability. What are these companies that you mentioned in the piece? Can, can we talk about there's a Swedish small cap, I think. Uh, what it does is quite interesting, but again, it, it's been struggling. And then uh, some other companies are having making types with Siemens and things like that as well. So some are trying to, to feed into a bigger, more established player, which seems sensible too. Yeah, so the, the Swedish one you mentioned is basically open the world's first industrial scale textile chemical recycling facility, which can take clothes sort of disintegrate them into some sort of slurry and then create a new type of fibre which can then be used and recycle back into the supply chain. And you, you read about it and think, wow, sort of how is it the first one that's doing this, number one? But also it sounds like magic um, and it does have a lot of big retailers on board. But as with a lot of new technologies, it's running into all sorts of operational issues. There's also been a big problem just with demand because I think you've seen I know retailers haven't been thriving in the current environment. The big established players have been struggling with destocking and retailers not needing as much material. So these smaller companies, which are just at this this crucial moment of growth, are, are taking a pretty nasty hit, I think. Um, but yeah, as a technology, it sounds really, really interesting. And in the UK, Coates is uh, an example that might come to mind for a lot of people as a UK listed company involved in this kind of thing. You know, what, what's it doing to, to keep itself, I don't want to say relevant because, uh, you know, threads will, will always be relevant in some form, but, but what's it doing in this context and how's it faring at the moment? So Coates generally has been having a bit of a hard time because, as I mentioned, you've got these destocking trends, so it's selling less thread. Mm. Um, but it has been investing quite heavily in this new type of products, which basically uses recycled plastic bottles to create thread. And thread's typically made of oil, so it's a big, big change. Um, and a few analysts I spoke to were quite excited about it because they're basically saying, you know, they can charge more for these products and hopefully will sort of entice new customers as as retailers start thinking we're going to have to change the way we operate and become a bit more eco-friendly. Um, and you've seen it in the results, you know, it's managed to sustain growth in this section, even while sort of its mainstream products have been struggling. So it does seem to be sort of holding true that this is a, a good area of growth. But at the same time with Coates, it's a massive company. It's got hugely established relationships with customers, sort of very established manufacturing bases. So it feels much more like a, a safe haven than some of these smaller ones. Is there a valuation case there at the moment for the company? Or do we have to work through 
a bit more of this destocking first, perhaps. It is cheaper than its five-year average, so its forward price-to-earnings ratio is currently about 9.9, and on average it's been 12.3. So I think it does look appealing at the moment, and it does seem like it has stayed very robust, even though it's been very tricky at the time. You know, it's been making lots of cost savings, it's been gaining market share, even while demand's been been weak. So I don't know, I think it's it's an impressive one. Another aspect of this, as we've alluded to, is the recycling side of things. Uh, you know, a lot of there is a lot of waste, and there are two aspects to this, aren't there? There's the actual recycling, and then there's the reselling side. And, and the former certainly has more listed opportunities, and there's been a lot more activity in that space. The latter is growing quickly, but a lot of them aren't really uh, on the market, frankly. Yes. So I went in when I started the piece, being like, recycling. This will probably be the the big exciting area. There must be loads of work being done here. And then I spoke to a lot of analysts and fund managers, and they didn't seem that enthused. Um, but there are a few big options. So there's Veolia in France, which is basically remodelling itself as this sort of green, sustainable player. So that's an interesting one. And that features in quite a lot of these new funds which are focused on the circular economy. Um, in the UK, it's not so much linked to textiles, but there's Renewi, and that's had some takeover interest, which saw shares go up. So it does seem to be sort of an interesting area. But it, from what I was hearing, it seems these sort of platform models where you can buy existing clothes were more exciting from a returns perspective just because recycling companies are so reliant on the demand for the recycled goods which hasn't been super strong and is just massively capital intensive. Yeah uh, those are two good points I think aren't they the capital intensity and also some of the predictions from a few years ago about the the path of this recycling growth haven't quite panned out yet so uh, we'll see on that front. Alex I don't know if you have have some thoughts about the textiles sector, either in in some or a small part of it. What we've just been talking about here, yeah. So maybe two points. One, just the, just the last point there on on recycling. I mean, the, I suppose to uh, cling on to a, a fairly newsy uh, company, Vinted. I mean, the, their success. It feels like, I think, like, like we've been saying, like recycling really feels like a, a, a real growth industry. Um, but I suppose the the caution is is around how much momentum there might be with you know even with a, a name like Vinted where reportedly lots and lots of people are now selling on the platform, and uh, you know this is all these virtuous cycles. If you think about you know the name in circular fashion economy before you know before anyone before the people were launching ETFs promising to um, you know capture this slice of the market was eBay and I mean they've. They have really struggled to grow in recent years, whether that's due to a kind of a stale brand or, or you know, their their fee structure with sellers. You know, if if they can't make you know some gains from the renewed interest in in recycling, then you sort of think that's probably fairly in, indicative of of the you know the role of recycling within the fashion industry. Um, and then the other point I just want to make, I just I was just reading through Gemma's um, piece and like there, you know, there's so many parallels with the energy market here that, you know, we know that there's this huge environmentally destructive footprint for textiles and it, the knock-on effects, I suppose, for investors that cast this regulatory pull over the investability of the sector. So, you know, not only have we seen with Boohoo and, and, and ASOS sort of real concerns about their sort of viability um future viability and uh, but but yeah the 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 same time you know as the rise of shine shows just the demand for cheap high footprint fast fashion is just not going away and we can't un- really unhook ourselves from this stuff so it's almost like we don't want to admit it but the um you know the growth that some of the growth stories out there are still the same old growth stories as with as with energy markets. Well, just on the uh, the, the platform side, uh, Vinted, you know, there, as you mentioned in the piece, there are suggestions that it might be uh, looking to go public at some point in the future. Depop, its rival, is owned by Etsy, which is maybe another case of, you know, look at the share price there, and that's really struggled. It's very hard to, you can't separate that from the pandemic, though, obviously, Etsy's share price soared during the pandemic and has slumped since, and, you know, you kind of need to discount that whole period, I think. Uh, so there are, you know, there is a listed option there if you want to take on the Etsy side of things but it's a bit difficult so maybe those will, will develop in the, in the years ahead well I think just just to add to that you know Depop made a, a pretty significant loss in its most recent most recent period for which there are numbers mm. they're both London companies 
Depop lost 60 million pounds on sales of 54. Um, and I think Vinted is probably fits that recycling side a bit better because Depop is a bit more name brand sales. And it, yeah, it's interesting you go into the, the, the slight differences of, of the markets between them, but yeah, Vinted is much more that, you know, two, three pound sale instead of donating something that'll mm. end up on a gun a and mm. beach. Well, I think Depop as well charges sellers and Vinted doesn't as well. So maybe there's potential for those things to change too. Anyway, we'll go on to a, not a completely different subject now because we've been talking about this, this need for, uh, to recycle and this need to become more environmentally friendly. But now we're going to talk about a, a company that effectively doles out a lot of promotional tat and does very well uh, <laughs> at doing that. That's for imprint. Uh, it, had a trading up, <laughs> it had a trading update the other day, which once again, as with most of its recent trading updates, was very good. Uh, the numbers are strong. It's still looking pretty good. Is that a fair assessment, Gemma? I think it is. People can't <laughs> get enough of their hoodies, their key rings, their little tote bags. They cover it all. But yeah, it's been an amazing company, really, in terms of, I think a lot of people thought, oh, during COVID, obviously, no conferences, it'll just have a little bit of a boost as people come back to normal. But it's just consistently exceeded expectations. Um, even even this latest trading update, it said old profit would be slightly above the upper end of the current range. And you can just see sort of when you look at the forecast, they've just been tracking upwards over the last year. So, yeah, a real a real surprising success story, I think. Are we too uh, snobby about companies like this? I think I mentioned that in uh, allusion to... Uh, the time we spoke about Me Group, which has been another success until recently, you know, the uh, vending machine and, and laundry purveyor in the UK. These kind of companies, as I say, I said tat at the top, you know, they're not uh, glamorous, but they are doing what they do very well, as you've just said. It, the analyst coverage as well is maybe a, a plus for uh, private investors listening in that it's not massive. You know, you get some of the smaller brokers covering for imprint. The bigger companies don't, even though it's a pretty large company now, which Again, I don't know if that's a thinking this is all going to come crashing back down to earth. You know, is that a, a tailwind for the company in some ways? Because people don't believe they can do these things. And so expectations are slightly lower. Possibly. I mean, I think there is a tendency to overlook companies that are doing something more old school. I would say it's a very popular stock with small cap fund managers. Mm. It seems to pop up a lot, a lot of their their funds. But I think there are probably a couple of things that people missed about for imprint originally. Um, and the first is sort of the progress it was making on its margins. So I was talking to one fund manager, I think it was last year, and she said they used to have, ironically for sort of a marketing company, an absolutely terrible approach to their own marketing. So they didn't really invest. They were sending people little boxes of their products in the post rather than going for like TV or online advertising. And anyway, they had a big rethink and started investing more into their own marketing. And that seemed to have sort of a massive impact on the returns. So suddenly they were putting this money in and getting many, many more customers. And its profit margin has just been climbing as a result of that. So I think that's been a big factor of its success. Um, and the other thing to, to notice is that it's got a drop shipping model, which basically means it doesn't touch many of the products it sells it basically just connects the customer to the supplier occasionally it does a bit of the the printing that needs to happen but not often so it's basically just sort of creaming a bit of a margin off the top so it doesn't have that sort of inventory risk you don't have to have huge warehouses keeping all the stuff it's a very lean model in a way um, which clearly clearly is working as you say fund managers and investors of all kinds have certainly cottoned on in the, in the last couple of years and therefore Notwithstanding the the uh, expectations about the company in general, in terms of growth expectations, they're you know embedded fairly high hopes now for the company. Still, feeds through to the valuation, of course. Do we think this run can keep going? Is the big question. It is very keyed into the U.S. market in particular, so in some ways reliant on the health of the U.S. economy. Mm. Uh, there was there has been a promotional goods market slowdown, apparently, according to Peel Hunt. Um, but as yet, that hasn't seemed to have any effect on the demand. And I think it's it's important that it's a very fragmented market and for imprint is actually re still relatively small within that, but it's doing a great job of, you know, winning, winning business. So even if there is a bit of a slowdown, if it can continue sort of making those gains, it should hopefully offset it. Mm. Um, and at the moment, the outlook seems to be very positive, but I suppose it could always could always reverse. But you think if it sort of managed to sustain really, really strong growth through the last year it looks pretty um 
pretty robust. Indeed. Yeah, I think that is another case of a company where the market is starting to contract, but it's still gaining market share. And so therefore, you know, doing well in that regard, whether that can continue, we'll see. The other thing is the from the latest trading update is the cash balance was was quite a bit higher than uh, certainly than analysts expected. It seemed like some good working capital management, which again, maybe raises the prospect of further distributions sometime this year. Yeah, very possibly. And I think there was a special dividend I think it was last year, possibly the year before, which again sort of provided a nice, nice boost for shareholders and dividends have been climbing, climbing well. So I think that's another sort of interesting aspect of it. Indeed. At the same time, of course, when a company has, has risen this far, there are always risks. So, uh, uh, you know, it's far from a done deal. But uh, certainly an interesting company and one doing well in the UK market at the moment. That, though, does bring us to the end of today's show. We have unfortunately run out of time. So thank you very much to Gemma. To both Alex's, to Julian, and to our producer, Maddie Apthorpe, we'll see you next time on another Companies and Markets show. 